Hello, my name's Anthony. Um, I'm here as a professor at the University of Canterbury. And I have to start with some formal parts. And then I'm going to plunge the lights down and get a bit less formal. Um, <laughs> so, the things you need to know about this place is the toilets are out the door around the corner. And if there's an emergency, we meet in the Hydro car park, which is out that way. You can probably just go and follow everyone else out. So, thank you for coming. Um, now, I'm going to be talking about imaging tonight. <coughs> Excuse me. And so, that's best done showing pictures. And that means we need to have some lights out. So, I'm going to turn these down quite a lot. Hopefully. And I can begin. So, as I said, my name's Anthony. Um, I'm a researcher here at the University of Canterbury, and I'm a researcher at the University of Otago. Um, I also happen to be a researcher at CERN, and I've had various hobbies over the years, ranging from computer engineering, which is what I did my PhD in, uh, medicine, which is what I do on Thursdays and Fridays, and Mars, which is what I do for the rest of the week. Um, so I'm going to be talking about Mars, it's a, our team, um, and our product, and this is colour x-rays for medicine. What I'd like to do, and we'll start with, is just imagine if I could look inside my father's hand, that's his hand there, and measure the calcium, the fat, the water, and other components of his hand without having to attack with a hacksaw. What would that mean? What can we learn about the world? I have got a clicker so you can see me wandering back and forth. So, this is the picture we took. Um, we consider this to be a new x ray microscope, a new way to look inside people. Um, this is quite a lot of data. Every element of that image is one nanoliter, so that's about the thickness of a human hair, 100 micron. We measured eight x-ray colours, I'll explain that in a minute. And that gives us about 8,000 times as much data as traditional x-ray imaging. Now this image, um, as I said in my father's watch, it was seen by more than 40 million people on Twitter. Um, it got on BBC, CNN, um, Science, Nature, um, and hundreds of websites around the world, which surprised me, um, but it doesn't really have a full week to get tonight, or almost a full week to get it. So my talk tonight, I'm going to go through the basics of x-rays, because I know not everyone is familiar with x-rays, um, and computer tomography, which is a term that was developed in the 70s. I want to talk about CERN, that big particle accelerator in Europe, um, the detectors they've developed, and how that leads to being able to measure the colour of x-rays. I'm going to talk about our scanners, um, right back to some of our early pictures and then take us forward to what we can do now. Then I'm going to talk about the medical impact. How could this affect people in our community and around the world? And then I'm going to show our first human images, what we think that signals for the future, and then a little bit about how we take it out to everybody else. So first of all, our tank, our tank's quite large. Um, we're fairly roughly split between Canterbury and Otago, the Otago being the medical school in the town, the University of Otago of Christchurch. Um, we also happen to partner with Lincoln University, we've got a few staff out there, and actually a few sheep. Um, and we partner with Auckland University for um, some physics work. We have a bunch of international partners um, scattered around the world. We must sort of, in my own mind, divide them up into technical institutes and medical schools. Um, they number about 40 to 50 if you look at the number of MOUs and joint publications we've had. So we're very, very much an internationally focused team. Uh, and we've got some commercial partners. Uh, Mars Bioimaging, which is a spin-out company from the university that's commercialising this technology. And I should just give some disclosure. Myself and most team members are actually shareholders in that company. Uh, we work with local industries like ILR and Shamrock uh, Electronics and Precision uh, Engineering companies around town. And we have a partnership agreement with GE Healthcare. GE claimed to be the largest engineering firm in the world. We have about 50 people in Christchurch. Uh, one day, a little under half of us went for a walk up onto the Port Hills and got this nice photo. Um, I put this up for two reasons. One, um, it's typical Christchurch, very multicultural. And the other is I like to point out that we have physicists, engineers, mathematicians, biochemists, pathologists, surgeons, radiologists. It's a very, very diverse team. And that keeps me interested, and I think it keeps the whole team interested. So x-rays and computer tomography, what are these things? Um, and what, what's important to know about them? Well, this is the first x-ray taken in 1895 um, by Wilhelm Röntgen. 
It's in his wife's hand. Um, and he, you can actually see the bones in it. It doesn't look too different from a standard thing that we would call an x-ray. He called it an x-ray because he didn't know how it worked, but he knew you got a picture. Um, the interesting thing is he's gold here. That shows up black or attenuate, just like the calcium. I'm going to explain to you in this talk why that's a limitation of the technique, because actually they're different colours. On the left hand side we have a picture of how most x-ray systems work. We have an x-ray source um, that works a little bit like those old uh, TVs that you have, the CRT TVs, they're an electron gun, <coughs> an object, and if you're in a hospital you might call that a patient. Um, you have a detector system, in that case a fluorescent screen that kind of glows when the x-rays hit it, and then you have a pattern recognition system. Um, and depending on where you work, that will either be a person, a computer, or most likely a combination of the two. So x-rays have colour. Most people don't know this, but it's actually true. It's part of the electromagnetic spectrum. At one end we have radio waves, and at the other end we have gamma rays, and in the middle um, we have visible light. And so we're, so we're used to thinking about red, green, and blue as being different wavelengths, frequencies, or energies for visible light, the colour. But actually x-rays do exactly the same thing. The energy of visible light is about <coughs> one and a half to three electron volts, that's a measure of wavelength, or energy, or frequency, or colour, just that's a convenient one, and that's about chemical binding energy. Further down, um, we're at between 20 and 120 keV, we have the x-rays we use in medicine. So they're coming in different x-ray colours as well, over that range, um, but instead of being the chemical range, they're actually at the atomic range, they're measuring stuff that's going on at the nuclear scale, the air uh, the inner, inner, inner shells of the uh, atom. Computer tomography, um, this is a 3D x-ray, so you take your x-ray source and you rotate it around the object, you take pictures from all angles and you get a picture like this. So this is someone, um, I just pulled put this off the web, this person we've had an image through their chest, um, it's a sort of transverse slices and I can see that they've got a lung cancer going on there. Now one of the interesting things, I don't have a pointer, so I'll run over the point, this here's their pulmonary artery, their, their the big artery that comes out from the heart. That's white because it's full of iodinated contrast. So are their bones, they're also white. Again, those two things are different x-ray colours, but we can't see them on this picture. Now New Zealand has actually been involved in this sort of work for quite a long time. And what I'm going to talk about is a bit of particle physics and a bit of medical imaging. So Ernest Rutherford um, was our most famous particle physicist. In fact, most people in the world will credit him with the uh, formation of particle physics. Uh, we've actually been doing medical imaging in Christchurch for a long time. Uh, two people in the 1970s, Bates and Peters, actually built a CT scan. They built it about six months after Townsfield published his first papers and got a Nobel Prize. They started about the same time. Um, and in 1972, like all good New Zealanders, they took an image of sheep. <laughs> so now I'll we'll talk about CERN, new detectors and measuring colour x-rays. So this is CERN here on the left, um, this is the campus here. Uh, it's an international organisation that's goal is to further particle physics. They claim to be the world's largest physics lab, and it's probably true, they've got sort of 10,000 users, they have a few thousand on site, but they actually have <coughs> hundreds of countries, I think about 180 countries, that are members of CERN, and scientists can go there for a week, a month, or a year, um, and, and do physics. They've done a few important things, most well known and probably is the World Wide Web. Um, the most famous recently is probably the Higgs boson. Uh, they actually had the world's first web server to design the web in the early 90s. So this circle there is a large hadron collider that's sending particles in opposite directions to bang into each other. And they do that in four places around the ring. And one of these places here, um, I've got a dot, a narrow is on the compact muon solenoid. That's an experiment that was built to look for the Higgs boson. That detector there is actually 100 metres underground. It weighs 12,500 tonnes. Um, and when it was being designed, it was going to produce more data in a month than was currently available in the world. I think we're starting to catch up with movies and things now, but at the time it was a massive, massive amount of data. Uh, again, here's my father. He's a guy I work with a lot. Um, and over on the far side is what I call the pixel barrel. So in the middle of the compact muon solenoid is a 
set of detectors for measuring those particles, that's this thing here on the right, um, that CERN designed probably in the early 80s and the 90s. And they, what they realized is they needed to measure individual particles one at a time and measure the energy of those particles with very good location in space, very good energy, at resolution, and at time of resolution. So they built these packing barrels. So they developed an entirely new type of detector to help them uh, find the exposure. Yeah, yeah, a bunch of scientists um, in the late 90s said, hang on a minute, we're measuring particles here with these new detectors. We should be able to measure X-rays. So collaboration four, which you to uh, Medipix four, it encompasses about 25 universities. They come to our <coughs> women. I think we're about 25 at the moment. Um, mostly physicists and engineers interested in building detectors for X-rays. They call it Medibus because, well, we thought it would be useful for medicine. Um, and this is a picture of the collaboration in a meeting in Prague in about 2009. It's a conference, probably less than half of the people working on it actually attended. Um, but you can see it's quite a lot of people and, again, as I say, very multinational. Now, what the Medibus collaboration did is they built detectors that can measure color. So in 1985, we've got the photographic plate measuring um, Mr. Bronkin's uh, wife's hand. In 2006 in New Zealand, we took a color picture of a human fetus um, using a medibac detector. We took four colors at that stage. It's only a 14 by 14 millimeter image, but we were able to measure the X-ray color and we could see that the bones, and they're still forming because it's a um, a different X-ray colour from the background materials like soft tissues. So that established that in living tissues we could measure that X-ray colour just using the detector. This is a detector we use now, Medipix 3. It can measure up to eight colours at once. It's got pixel elements, a little like, like if you're familiar with your digital camera, you talk about the pixels. Well, the pixels in this are about 110 microns square. That's the human here is 100 microns. So put some scale on 100 microns thickness. It's got 16,000 pixels per detector, and it's got about four and a half thousand transistors per pixel. So it's actually a little computer. Okay. So if you think of four and a half thousand transistors and 16,000 pixels, I can't do the math. Put in front of on my head in front of a few hundred people, but it's got lots of transistors. It's got this really neat feature called charge summing that I'd like to talk about because it's one of the more cool things that, in the technology. If we have a 100 kV photon coming in, it can hit a crop in the detector and it actually makes a big splash. It has lots of secondary events, it produces an electron hole cloud, um, you get <coughs> uh, um, uh, extra photons coming off the, the cadmium telluride that they eject it out and they travel through the sensor. So this is bad. What it can do is mean you get four Pixel set, so you're going to see four events, and instead of recording 100, you might record 10, 10, 20, and 60. So you've lost all your energy information and you've lost your spatial resolution. These pixels talk to each other and add it together and give it back to the central pixel. So remember, I said this is one doing this on one photon? Well, an X ray beam that we use in CT is 10 to the 9 photons per second per square millimeter. So these pixels have to talk to each other at this vastly fast rate to just say that was one event, that was one event, that was one event, except a whole lot faster than I just did. 10 to the 9 photons per second per square mile. So that's the underlying technology. We turn this into scanners. <coughs> this is my view of a standard hospital CT. You've got that X-ray source on the left hand side. It's putting out a range of frequencies, wavelengths, colours. I'm just going to use those as synonyms. Passes through the patient, it's attenuated, and you have a grayscale detector, just like that first black and white photo I showed the person holding up the detector, and it glows, and then you these days you put that into an electric couple and you get a Hounsfield unit out of it. But you can see the technology is actually not too different from those early black and white pictures I showed. Several places, um, the hospital and uh, actually Otago University now too, have dual energy scanners. I have to say thank G, they gave us one. Um, we have an X two X-ray sources putting out different colours. They're attenuated by the object, 
Two detectors get two points on the attenuation curve. So that gives you a glimpse of what colour information might be. So if you go to the hospital nowadays and you broke, break your arm, they may actually do a dual energy scan to look for something called bone bruising. We can do that now at the hospital. But we've gone back to this system. We've gone to a single X-ray source passing through an object and a clever detector, and we get eight colours simultaneously. So we get much purer data, we do it at a much higher resolution, and although I said we're using eight energies now, by 2022 we expect to be using six to eight. So this, well, instead of going from one or two energies, this technique allows us to go to full spectral imaging, and with eight energies, I think we're starting to see the benefit. This is the first scanner we built in Christchurch in 2007. Um, it was built in actually a cupboard in the physics department because it had nice concrete walls for radiation. Um, it's like a standard CT scanner. This orange bit here is the X-ray source. The bit in the plastic tube is the object, um, and at the back is a little medipix detector. The object there actually happens to be part of my lunch. Um, I put an apple core wrapped in gland wrap with a um, twist tie around it. Made a very nice object image. So we got this working, and actually it was basically that image of that, of that apple that's here, yeah, this is we're looking into further. So we carried it to the medical school and started saying, what can we do with this? So we looked at some very common elements that we use in, in medicine. So we looked at calcium and water, they're all of us obviously, and we looked at iodine, barium and gadolinium. So these are used routinely in hospitals um, as part of x-ray imaging systems. By being able to measure the x-ray colour, we should be able to quantify the amount of water, we should be able to quantify the amount of calcium, and we should also be able to see those materials as separate objects. This is the mouse that we looked at. Um, we put iodine into its pulmonary circulation, so the right side of the heart, actually put it straight through the chest, into the heart. Um, we put barium into the lungs, and we just squeeze it down the throat. Um, and then of course you've got calcium in the bones and waters in the soft tissues. And as you can see on the graph, they're different x-ray colours. So this is colour this way and attenuation that way. So we should be able to separate these if we can measure that x-ray colour. And we've got this picture. So this is a mouse. Um, it did actually take about 24 hours to scan it. Um, but we can see the iodine in the pulmonary circulation. We can see the barium in the lungs. We coloured them red and blue just because we needed to give them a colour. But that's actually measuring the iodine and measuring the barium and measuring the calcium and measuring the soft tissues. So we knew we could do it. Okay, we could see these things. The question is, what do you do with that? Okay, it's all very well to say, oh, I can see something no one else can, but you need to understand how to use it. So we started building these scanners. Um, these ones are designed for medical schools. They look a little bit like a barbecue. You lift the lid up, you put the sample in. Um, these scanners have allowed us to work with international groups. So currently we're working with groups in Melbourne, Mumbai, Moscow, Lausanne, Madrid, uh, Boston area, uh, Indiana, Oregon, California. So this is again a worldwide collaboration, lots of different medical schools involved. And everyone seems to work on slightly different things. Every time I go to another medical school they say, have you thought of doing this? And usually we have to say, no we haven't yet, but it's a good idea. And then we do it. <laughs> um, we actually won some awards last year um, from the New Zealand Innovation Council and Canterbury Champion Award, which was delightful. Um, I think we won five, but I'll keep what they all about. Anyway, this is the team um, who, who packed up that scanner to Notre Dame that I showed. We work, we call our system human ready, because we work in the human energy range of X-rays. Um, we use detector material that we would use in a big scanner. Um, we do continuous spirals around the object, um, and we've build a system that's scalable. So we call that human translatable. And what that means is anything that we do on this little machine, we can predict how it's going to go in the human. We start to image living human. So instead of just going straight to a big machine, we built these smaller machines, encourage med schools to start doing research with them, and then knowing that as we build a human machine, any work they've done will be translated. Uh, we, so we made it for biomedical users, we've automated the detector setup, we've um, put a big green button so you push the air and it starts, uh, and we've developed some visualisation and analysis tools. This is our visualisation tool, it's designed in the HIT lab here in Christchurch. <coughs> that was another, I spent a few years in the HIT lab, another copy I did for 
Um, at the top, we have a standard viewer. We can do detailed measurements, regions of interest and stuff. Down below, you've got a 3D viewer. You put your glasses on, the object sits out in front. You can manipulate the object, and then that's synced up with the view at the top. Um, so you can see the cut plane they're, they're using is the two views at the top. Because we wanted researchers to use our system, we provide the raw data because it actually turns out a lot of these medical schools actually work for mathematicians and they've got better ways of doing image processing than us. Um, we provide the material volumes and our two and 3D viewer. So really this is a tool to enable other people to learn how to use this technology. We made it scalable as I said, so instead of producing one detector, that image on the left there is five detectors all stacked up, so we can make a strip as big as we want, which means we can image any size object we want. That's five, that lets you do an object about this big, um, like a geological sample, um, a rabbit, um, a wrist. <coughs> Excuse me. So what's the potential medical um, impact? <coughs> Currently around the world, there's 300 million CT scans performed every year. They're done for heart disease, stroke, cancer, car crashes. Just about every medical diagnosis ends up on a CT scan at some stage. Imagine what would happen if they were colour. The trick is we don't know. Right, so I want to show you some of the results which give a hint to where this may be useful. What we realised early on is what we're doing is molecular imaging. We want to know what is the tissue, as I said I, right at the beginning, not with my father's wrist. Is that fat or is that water or is that calcium? We need to look at that. We need to look at behaviour. So we need the ability to track cell lines, track physiological processes. Is the treatment working? Someone's got cancer, we give them a drug. Did the drug actually get into the cancer? Simple stuff like that. They're actually remarkably hard questions to answer. So we built our system to, to look at the constituents, the physiological markers, and some various labels. And in the medical world, this tends to get called molecular imaging. So interestingly, those first pictures that I showed you from Rontgen, I might consider anatomical. They outline shapes, but here we're outlining biochemistry and molecular information. So this is a first sort of study. <coughs> Over on the end, We've got a single energy, this is a, a perspex phantom about this big, and we've got uh, loaded into it various materials. And you can't tell what's what. You can see they're attenuating differently, but that's, that's all on a single energy. When you switch on the colour information, you can see the calcium, the gadolinium, and the iodine, and the fat, and the water, um, and the gold. So you can actually measure those things independently. On our current scanner, we can do a mouse in about eight minutes. Um, at 80 or 70 micron resolution, depending on how you quite tune it. This mouse here, um, we coloured the water blue, and as we strip the layers off, we can see that the iodine that we injected went to the kidneys and the bladder, the gadolinium went to the bowel, and the gold went to the lungs, and we can strip it right down and just show the raw components. So what do we want to do first? We've got a new tool. Let's try and quantify some stuff. Look at some soft tissues. Started with a lamb chop. Um, it's a bit of meat. And we knew that it had muscle and fat and bone, and you can get it at the butcher and at the end of the week you finish with it, you throw it in the rubbish or the green bin, I guess, and get another one for the next week. We shoved it in the metal tube and we scanned it and we separated out the bone and the fat, the lipid, and the water. The PhD student at the time fused it together into its own image. It's not that pretty the colours he chose. I, like, I still leave this in my talk because it shows how we're measuring different components from the same scan. Okay, it's like three channels of information from one scan. And when we put into our <coughs> visualisation tool, it produces a 3D rendering. It looks a little bit like meat. And that's because we measured the components of the meat. Okay, so that's what I mean by soft tissue quantification. Okay, that's, that's again interesting bit of, I guess, biology at this stage or agricultural work. Let's move more towards medicine. We've got a number of clinical projects. We've got atheroma characterization uh, for stroke and heart disease. Uh, we've looked at bone and cartilage health. Uh, we've looked at metal implants, um, say a screw that's been used to fix a broken bone. Um, in fact, I was talking to a guy in Germany this week who puts electrodes into the brain 
because straight with image there, we said, why can't I use this tool? Um, we've done a lot of cancer imaging, um, both here and actually a number of our partners, and I'll show you some of the more significant results, to lead towards more personalised cancer treatment, and we've, of course, checked out no symmetry. So this is someone's neck, a little piece of gear. That artery heads up to the brain, and often it gets narrowed, and when it does, it can cause a mini-stroke, or a TIA, you might have heard the term, or a full-blown stroke. You can see the narrowing there, that's iodine shooting up to the brain and, and going through a very narrow part, and you can probably see there's a blob of calcium. Again, everything's white or grey, but hard to tell. Now these people often actually have that removed, okay? So they turn up with a, to our hospital with a TIA or a mini-stroke, we might decide to take that bit of artery out to clean it out with the blood flow better. So what we did is we took those surgical specimens. So that's the artery of someone's neck, up there, and we scanned it. And so that's a Mars image of, of an excised human artery. You can see the calcium and the narrowing of the, the blood vessel lumen, but actually here you can see the wall stick out and it's got a fatty core. That's actually really hard to see because the iodine is just putting the lumen out. The calcium you can see, but that fatty core there is actually remarkable, remarkably difficult to see. And we can see the, the middle of it. So that's very useful, we think. Here's another bit of work we did. Um, this plaque from this person um, has had a bleed into the middle of the plaque, what I call a hemorrhage or a micro hemorrhage, in fact. And we scan that plaque. And if we look inside it, we can see the iron deposition as well as the calcium. Now, if I were to scan that on an ordinary scanner, the iron and calcium would look white. I couldn't tell that that person had a microhemorrhage. Now, these are thought to be some of the most high-risk plaques, and we now have a tool that can see it, at least in a surgical specimen. Imagine what will happen when we can see that on every port, see it in patients who are going through the emergency department, and the doctors are trying to decide, do I leave that artery in there or do I take it out? We're providing them new information. We looked at bone health. This is something that um, Oregon Health Sciences tend to be very interested in. This is someone's hip, a bone here. Elderly people have a habit of falling over and breaking it. And it'd be really nice to know which people were at risk. <coughs> can we measure that? There are a few techniques. There's a dual energy technique. You can count some of the internal stuff. But these guys from Oregon have been putting these human femurs up. And they've been looking at the bone structure in the composition. And because we can do both simultaneously and we can very, very high resolution, they can see this microstructure of the bone, the trabecular and the cortex, but they can also measure a calcium map. So in someone who's developed an osteoporosis and is starting to lose calcium, we see that calcium loss. We might see the bone being resorbed the actual loss of trabecular. You can see the fat in the water. So if you have a broken bone on MRI, you can see bone bruising. You might actually be able to see that on CT now. If someone's got a bone tumour, like a metastasis, and it's infiltrating it through the bone, I'd love to know how those components there change during that disease process. But we have a tool that can see the bone in a new way. We've looked at it at this stage only four human femurs, um, but there's a whole heap more work to be done, and it's going to apply to all sorts of diseases. This is someone's tibial plateau. So this person has very bad osteoarthritis, and they've had their knee taken out. The other half of the knee that's not shown, the cartilage completely worn away. This half of the knee, the cartilage, that's that blue-red part, is a normal thickness. If I just looked at that um, in an operation down the scope, it looked like normal cartilage. If I looked on a standard CT or MRI, normal thickness of cartilage. Here, we've actually used an a agent called Hexabrick, put it in and incubate it with his knee, and we can start to measure the biochemical changes of osteoarthritis. So that means we're actually seeing the biochemistry before we're seeing the anatomical changes, the shape changes. And that could potentially allow people to develop new treatments and better predict who's going to go on and get worse disease. So this is another exciting thing. Interestingly, that's a calcium map along the bottom. It's not actually standard um, CT. And you can see that there's a, underneath the area where the arthritis is forming, there's calcium being laid down as well. It's getting thicker. We looked at metal artifacts, so again, this is some of our bone work. Um, titanium screws are pretty commonly used, wires, hip implants, knee implants. You might even be someone in the room here who's had an implant, perhaps. 
bit in an audience of the size there is. If we look at that on an ordinary CT, you get these artifacts, these strips and these lines from the metal. The cause of that is that the metal and the calcium are different colours, and when you do a CT reconstruction, you actually assume everything's the same colour. So when you look at something there, like the titanium and the bone, and they're different colours, you get those horrible lines. On our Mars image, we can actually measure that, and so we can see that bone metal interface much, much better. So if someone's getting a, a sore hip replacement, and you're wondering, is it loose, or is it getting cracks around, or is it getting an infection? We can actually see it. We can see that bone metal interface. So it'll be interesting to see as we start putting patients through our machines, how much more predictive value we'll have of that person's got pain because it's starting to loosen. That person's got pain because of a totally different problem, such as a muscular problem. So this is again new information, new ways to see inside the body. This is what I call a 3D printed scaffold. So the modern technique for bone replacement is you produce a porous scaffold, but like a sponge, and the bone and the scaffold fuse together. Okay, it's way better than cement again. You can imagine once they fused, it's not going to move. The problem is, when you're developing these things, or even assessing them in a person, when you scan them, you can't put them in an MR, you can't put metal in an MR. When you do a CT, you get all these artifacts. Again, look at that bone metal interface, we can see in this sheet, femur, um, the metal implant, that the bone and the cartilage here are fused really nicely. That's the top image. Here we've just shown the metal, we've actually cut away the calcium, so we can see them as separate channels. So we've got a tool that does two things this time. One, it allows people to design these scaffolds better than they could before. And two, it allows them to assess, is the scaffold actually working? So, the nice thing about providing tools is it lets other people do things. This is some work we've done um, around personalised cancer treatment. One of the things that happens with cancers is that everyone's cancer is just a little bit different from everyone else's. So here we've taken clusters of cells from breast cancer and uh, we incubate it and put them in a, in a warming drawer, basically, um, with some particles that attach to HER2 antigens. Now, HER2 you might have heard of on the news because it's a receptor that Herceptin binds to, so that drug therapy binds to. And what we've shown, um, I click here, is that the, our Herceptin nanoprobe bonds onto that cell cluster. So we've got an imaging tool that actually tells you about what cells are present in the tissue. Instead of just saying, a cancer's this big or a cancer's this big, you can say, you've got these cells in your cancer. And that will allow the treatment to be personalised to the, the, the cancer treatment to be personalised to the disease. This is some work from Notre Dame. It's a mouse, and uh, they have a, they get a grow breast cancer in the flank of the mouse and together that plant and the skin grows up. One of the things that happens in breast cancer is you get microcalcifications in certain types. They're quite hard to see. Sometimes you get a calcified dot that actually isn't a microcalcification from breast cancer, it's just a little calcified dot. So they've developed a nanoprobe that, firstly they can see calcium, we call it that blue, and we can see the nanoprobe we call it that red. So they can be very sure in that mouse that there are microcalcifications from breast cancer there. So that makes them easier to see and more certain than what you're seeing. Now stick these on the same slide because these could be done in the same patient. So if someone presents with breast cancer, you can imagine going to the fridge, pulling out a pharmaceutical here and squirt into their veins and it lights up different cell lines and different things. So when they get to the radiology department, you can see what sort of cancer it is, what cell lines are being expressed, what physiological processes are being it's molecular imaging, right? So this is taking your imaging from anatomy to biochemistry. We looked at X-ray dose. It's one of those things that people always wonder about. Um, this mouse, um, we put tissue dosimeters in and measured the X-ray dose. We've actually done computer modeling. Uh, we've done ion chamber measurements, all sorts of things to confirm that our X-ray dose is the same as other CTs. Um, what we do is we're using the same amount of x-rays, we just split it up into different parts. There's actually quite a lot of research from other groups around the world that says with these highly sensitive detectors that are measuring every photon, we should be able to go to lower doses. But at this stage, we're focused on keeping our dose the same and getting more diagnostic information for the doctors. 
So she wanted to keep things about this picture for a while. The tissue dosimeters that are meant to be exactly the same as the tissue turn out to be different X-ray colors than the tissue, uh, which is why they're orange there. Um, you sort of know, but we were a bit surprised that we were that sensitive to the different types of X-ray color. So, first human images, we took these in April and May this year. Um, again, this is my father, professor of physics, standard model of the um, particle physics on his back and a foot in our scanner. Um, we've used exactly the same technology that we used in those small scanners. Now, remember I said these are human translatable? Here, we've used the same technology made bigger so we could reproduce the results. What everything that I've shown you in the preclinical settings I put on those small scanners, we can now start to investigate and prove in the big machines. So essentially, we're going from that image of a mouse to that image of a wrist. And remember, we're doing images at the scale of a human hair, thickness of a human hair, eight colors, and 8,000 times as much data as a standard sampling. This is his foot. Um, you can see the back pad, you can see the bone, we've made the water translucent in red so it looks a bit like a grotesque thing from a horror movie perhaps. <laughs> Don't know, I quite like it actually. Um, and of course we can look inside so we can see the structure of the, the bone, it's a calcium map there that's white, we've done the, the fat map, it's a kind of grey colour. Um, this is a 1.5 litre volume and it gives us 15 gigabytes of data which means if we do a whole person, it's about two terabytes of data. Um, we'll get there. Um, in the last 10 years we've been doing this project, um, the amount of data we can cope with has gone up by sort of 10 to 50 times. I'm sure over the next 10 years we'll be quite happy with doing two terabytes of person. The other thing I quite like about this, you can see is wrinkled feet. <laughs> Just comparing it with other modalities, you can see from our Mars scans, the three channels that we're getting, and uh, I just grabbed some library images of CT and MR. So you can see we're providing some of the CT information, some of the MR information, but we're doing it all at one scan, um, and we're doing it at much, much higher spatial resolution. So these first human images, we can just look at them in the various channels, and we're getting bone microstructure, <coughs> bone mineralization, and good images of the soft tissues. And we can couple all that with the data we've got of the small bore image of the cartilage and the bone metal interface and stuff. So, hang on a minute, this is going to be quite good for joints. <laughs> so, we've, we've spoken to a few orthopods um, and they're very keen to start trying these out. Um, and we're going to uh, start clinical trials of orthopedic patients and rheumatology patients basically as soon as we get everything's approved through. So, how do we take this from where we are now to the community? There's a couple of trends in radiology. One of them is so point of care scanners. You may sound like a funny term, but if you go to the dentist, you get your x-rays done by the dentist before they start sticking stuff into your mouth. If you go to an obstetrician, they will have an ultrasound and they will scan the woman as they make the diagnosis. Some joint surgeons will have an ultrasound to examine the shoulder um, while they're doing it. So taking the imaging to the patient is a really, really good way to get it out there. Now, it turns out that we're quite well suited to that because we have large data sets. We only want to do small parts initially anyway. And we have very, very low power x-ray tubes, um, which means we often don't need to shield the room. We can make them in a closed case. So you can actually imagine off a scanner. Um, and then cloud-based image interpretation. If you've got the scanner by the patient and the doctor, how do you get the expertise? Well, one of the things that's happening more and more in radiology um, is getting the radiologists across the internet. I was working in Australia earlier this year um, and I was working in a shopping mall because that's where the patients were. But still, half of my patients were more than 200 kilometres away in the outback. So this is getting very common and we want to leverage that. And of course, once you've got your data in the cloud, you can couple that with artificial intelligence to improve accuracy and efficiency. So, come back to here. We've got a new microscope for seeing inside old solid objects. I've talked about some biological applications, but one of the things you can also see here is you can see inside the watch, okay? Um, and that's a solid metal object. 
So we've been looking at other things. These are some other images we've done. We've looked at geological samples uh, for the geologists here at Canterbury. We're in discussion with various groups in the mining industry. They want to see hydrocarbons in the rock. It's fat. Well, we call it oil when it's in a rock. Um, border security, that's a crab that came from the beach, but the Ministry of Primary Industries probably wants to find that it's in uh, suitcases. We have a partnership with Livermore Lab in uh, San Francisco, um, and they are the regulatory body or research body for border security um, in the US, and they have a problem trying to distinguish a sausage from plastic explosives, and this sort of data may be helpful. Um, and food quality, although I showed that as our test of soft tissues, that was actually um, done in partnership with one of the uh, meat processing groups in town because they want to be able to identify the quality of the meat, um, preferably before they cut it, but at least before they sell it, and be able to measure the, the marbling of fat through the meat determines the price. So there's all these other applications, I'm sure you can think of lots more yourself, but um, it'll be good to get it out there. So thank you. Um, I'm two minutes short, I was told not to talk for more than 45 minutes, um, because of any questions. Does anyone have any questions? Economics, but that's a that's a complex question. There's a couple of trends going on. Um, it should be the same price, right? This is microchip technology. The problem at the moment is a lot of these detectors are hand built. When I that we do runs of sort of 50 detectors or 100 detectors, um, and so they're done in microfabrication labs. And in fact, we use ones in Canada, Finland, and the Czech Republic just to produce one detector element. So it's expensive. But if you look at the same sorts of technologies that are using, it's what you find in your cell phone, your stack and its connection technologies. So it should scale really well, become relatively cheap. Um, so I don't see that as a problem. Um, it's like flat panel TVs, right? Flat panel TVs were expensive when they came out, and you give it five years and they're cheap, <coughs> maybe ten years. It'll be the same process. There's also some interesting trends going on in radiology itself. The radiology imaging market, um, it's relatively flat, so economists tell me, for these big machines, these big CTs and MR. What's happening is there's Chinese producers who are making machines half the price of, in fact, a third the price of the Siemens, G's and Philips, and they're just sort of doing mid-range machines. So the, the price has been driven down, but at the same time, the number of machines sold to surgeon, knee surgeons, wrist surgeons, dentists, is going up at about 10 or 15 percent a year. So these body part scanners are growing. So the economics of it is these body part scanners are getting more and more available, they're getting cheaper. Um, I've a friend who's a dentist who was about to buy what he called a comb beam 3D scanner. Um, and you can afford to do that with us. Um, have you patented um, this technology? And um, will you turn this into a kind of business in the future? Um, the, there's already a business, right? So the, we have a company that I introduced earlier, Mars Biomaging, and that sells these preclinical scanners. Um, and that has about 18 employees at the moment. Um, and it's kind of nice we an export only company. Um, so yes, we are. Um, your question about patenting is actually a lot more complex because there's a lot more stuff going on in here than just one trick, if you like. Um, and so there's a series of patents, there's no accounts and sorts of stuff, and we have paid for this. Can you quantitatively estimate the, the amounts, concentrations, or densities using this technology, or is it purely for visual? Oh, no, it's quantitative. Um, I've chosen pictures here, right? So um, if I go back through these, oh, some of these actually have the quantitative stuff on them. Um, I hope. Maybe I'll come all out. I know this one does. There we quantitated on that one, right? Um, 
on our 3D viewer, you can subscribe or circumscribe a region of interest and get the average of the material in there. So yes, it's totally quantitative. Um, it's one of the nice things about it. It's actually um, one of the problems with most imaging modalities is they're non-quantitative. And this is quantitative spread up. Does it require calibration every time you use it? Not even time, but it does require calibration. Um, when that first mouse I showed from 2007, was sort of a day to calibrate and a day to scan. Um, the calibrations now last for weeks to months. But it's the sort of thing that, you know, that, um, it's getting more and more automated. and you use AI and deep learning. Um, did you use historical data or you basically came up as you go in uh, identifying the colors? How many on average images do you combine to get a color? Okay, so what, we're not actually using AI in that area at all. What, we, what we're doing is we're recording the X-ray spectrum and then we use the X-ray spectrum to tell us what the material is, whether it's calcium or iodine or fat, and then we assign a color to make it easy to visualize. So those are the steps, if you like. Um, and choosing which X-ray colors to use is a bit of a challenge, because um, when the field was developing a few years ago, there were people out there saying, oh, you definitely do it this way, we definitely do it that way, which pretty much convinced me no one knew. Um, what happens is the, as the size of the object changes, and the materials change, the settings for what colours you should be looking at actually change a little bit. So if you've got a bigger object, you have less low energy X-rays getting through, so you have to push your colour choice up higher and higher. And the problem with imaging is you don't really know much about your object until you take the picture. It's the purpose of imaging, right? So um, the X-ray colours we use are under development in terms of how we choose them. Um, there's knowledge of which atoms uh, respond and which atoms influence x-rays is actually really well known. Before we had the periodic table, scientists used x-ray absorption to get all the elements in the right order. Okay, so um, the periodic x-ray colour was one of the ways we learned about the periodic table. So there's all that historical knowledge about x-rays interacting with matter. So we're just using that. How good is this technology at distinguishing different types of metals? Uh, so for example, would you be able to put, say, like a rusty nail inside one of your scanners and see how far through it had rusted? Um, it's a very specific question. <laughs> um, we're quite good at distinguishing types of metal. What happens is you get, as the metals get closer and closer on the periodic table, it gets harder and harder to tell them apart. Um, and as you get lower and lower concentrations, it gets harder to tell them apart. So, to answer your specific question about a rusty nail, in fact, you've got one metal there, right? And you, you're getting um, oxygen in there and, and the rust. So actually, the change is only the, basically in oxygen, and then the rust tends to get bigger because it's getting flaking and stuff. So you actually probably see change in density rather than change in metal in that situation. Um, so, yeah, it's a, it's a different question what you asked here. Um, the how well can we separate metals? The first mouse I showed had barium and iodine in them, and they're very close on the periodic table, and we can distinguish them as you can see quite easily. Um, whether we, that was a mouse size object, if we got a bigger object, that made it harder. <coughs> 
two questions. Do you support the new? The first, it looks like right now you're using or you're you're uh, investigating relatively small diameter objects, and um, I'm interested to know what the challenges are and your plans are for investigating, for example, objects as large as a human thorax, and uh, what what you see as uh, the issues with resolution and penetration. So that's the first question, and then what kind of Computing support do you need in the office or in uh, wherever the instrument is set up to actually support the image acquisition and reconstruction and storage? Okay, so um, again, you asked several questions at once, but the main thrust of your question was about the computers we're using and then how we see that evolving. The computers in our small scanner. Um, we have two computers, one a control computer and one's an image processing server. Um, the image processing server is medium size, $10,000 computer. I think it's got 32 cores and 64 gig of RAM. Can't remember exactly the details, it's a student here in my time. Um, but that kind of scale, it's a sort of $10,000 computer. Um, now, 10 years ago, that wasn't a $10,000 computer. So, um, you know, when you're moving with technology, it's always a running target. So. Um, I would expect that to keep changing. There's also algorithmic changes, right? We can downsample our data as it comes off the scanner. Now, in fact, we can do it as it comes off the detector and just bin it from 100 micron pixels to you know, millimeter pixels, lose a lot of information in the process. We don't want to do that until we actually understand how or where we where it's okay to do that. Um, there's also algorithm changes, like different types of mathematics allow you to do the things in different ways. So when we do those CT reconstructions, um, we start basically at a very low resolution, and as we iterate over time, it gets higher and higher resolution. Um, so one way to, to handle large data sets is just not go to such high resolution to reconstruction. And then there's actually even more complex ways you can do it when you're <coughs> say, um, in an object like I've got on the screen there, you need high resolution where the object is, and low resolution of the air outside. So there's all sorts of changes that can be done. Um, that's more than one PhD topic. <laughs> Diameter? Um, 120 keV will get through an object, a, a bit of water about this big. So you mentioned that technology is always changing. If you could maybe quantify the time it took to image the rat, and then how long did it take to image your father's foot? So what's our speed up is what you're asking? Yeah, correct. Um, the first mouse we did was about 24 hours to scan, and then about a month to get the data reconstructed. It's now about eight minutes to do a mouse, and half an hour, an hour to reconstruct, depending on how you choose it. Um, that's kind of normal in, in, in technology. You just sort of think of things doubling every 12 months. Um, and we've done that in our system <coughs> in different ways all the way through. Um, you know, we're using Medipix 3 at the moment. We expect to be using Medipix 4. That's 10 times faster. Uh, we expect to have much faster computers. We did the clock with a five chip array. We're going to build an array this big. Um, so, I roughly expect our system to double in performance every one to two years, in every part. And that sounds amazing until you actually look around and realise that's what every bit of technology does. So, so what are your nanoprobes made of? Sorry, what was the question? What are the, what's the composition of your nanoprobes? Uh, nanoprobes. So there's actually a whole different stack. No? Um, the, I used to have... Um, uh, EM electron microscope runs in Ryan's particles. So he has a, a silicon oxide shell, and in the middle he packs in gold. If we can see that, or hafnium, or gadolinium, or tantalum, or any of these metals with good X ray colours. And on the outside he puts um, an antibody to a cell line or, or something like that. Um, but he can put things like this phosphate on and stuff. The ones for the cell pellets, I think they're a bilipid layer, um, and again they pack in a heavy atom in the middle. And then they were putting on off-the-shelf monoclonals like um, 
cassette, which is why we use the U2, but there's other monoclonals that are available and you can buy them from pharmaceutical companies like the Tuck from Ag and stuff. Um, there's a group in Melbourne who make anti, who make nanoprobes that the diagram basically looks like a Christmas tree. They have a, an active site at the bottom and then a big branching structure and they hang um, the, the metal atoms off it like light like on a Christmas tree. So there's all sorts of different ways to do it. Basically, if it's got lots of metals between iodine and gold on the periodic table, we can see it. And then it comes down to the biochemist of how they get there and how safe it is. Will you be able to see vitamin and <coughs> amino acid uptake? I've got health food shops. Or can you see a future? Um, not those compounds themselves, because of the type of molecules they are. I mean, it may be possible to label them. There's a lady in Israel who visited us who measures those sort of physiological processes you're alluding to, like uptake. And what she does, she makes a macro molecule and she puts gold on one end, iodine on the other, and they take it into the cell and split. And one part of it's excreted from the cell and the other stays on, so she can measure the, the uh, metabolic process. So those sort of techniques may help people measure cellular uptake and stuff. But you've got a tool now that you can start looking at all these new imaging techniques. With regard to the radiation dose, what was the dose say of your father's foot versus a standard CT? And does that... It's about half. Um, and actually, I, uh, I was a license holder for the x-rays, and so just to hold my hand, I had one of the radiation dose and a few people from CERN um, present, um, one of the radiation protection people. We independently worked it out. We've got about eight hours of background radiation. So uh, one of the tricks for, for your hand and your foot, if you're over 40, it's basically radiation insensitive. Um, different bits of your body are sensitive to radiation in different amounts, like your thyroid, eyes and your gonads are very, very radiation sensitive. Young children are very radiation sensitive. A, 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 my father's hand is not very radiation sensitive. <laughs> Would you be able to image a larger object if your sensitive detectors were more sensitive? Um, yes. Um, well, we can do larger objects now. We can, we can get through this much more now. Right. Um, you can go bigger. What I didn't have was a diagram with a detector. It's two layers. The first layer is a semiconductor that's made of heavy metal. So it stops X-rays and conducts electricity. And the one we use is cadmium zinc telluride. So that the cadmium telluride are heavy atoms, they stop X-rays, but because of the way those two atoms sit on the periodic table, they behave like silicon. Um, so you can make thicker and thicker CZT and use higher and higher energy X-rays. So potentially you can make it through objects as well. Anyone else? To be honest, I can't see standard CT surviving. I know I'm a little bit out there when I say that, um, but it's a little bit like having black and white film. Why would you have it when you can have colour? I mean, I know we take art shots on our cameras, but we actually apply the black and white filter after the fact. Um, so as the cost comes down, there's actually basically no disadvantages in the technique compared to standard CT. And it's similar Higher resolution. You can go just as fast, you're going to um, use the same x ray dose. Why wouldn't you? When it comes to using nanoprobes, is the difference between this and CTSC just the resolution or do you actually get The color lets you see the probe. So the problem is um, so to, to take those breast microcosmications. Calcifications of white. When you do this sand CT image of it, if, you, if we didn't colour the calcification, we couldn't see the calcification, it's just white. And the nanoprobe is almost basically invisible. There's not very much of it. Um, and if you could see it at all, it would just be white, a little attenuated object, right? So you actually need to distinguish that from the bone. 
So we're working with a, another group where they're looking at nanoprobes for microfractures, so people would get stress fractures and they get fractures around implants. If you had a, didn't have a colour CT, there's no way you could see all of that on a background of bone and metal. You need the X-ray colour to separate the nanoprobe out. And the colour lets you quantify it as well. Then there's a lot for a little bit. Well, thank you very much. Um, enjoy yourself. Thank you.